Thank you for a fine scripture reading there. Very, very good. I would like to greet each one of you before I leave, but I don't know. They say I'm high risk, so I won't be able to do that. I want to talk to you today about a special time. We've all had special times in our lives that we can look back on and remember that we're special for one reason or the other. For me, right now is a special time that I have the privilege to present unto you the Word of God. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16 is a special time. It is special in that Jesus spent time alone with His closest followers. I want you to notice what He says to them in John 13. Last part of the chapter, He said, I'm going to leave you. And you cannot come with me now. You can come afterwards, but you can't come now. Peter said, Lord, why can't I go with you now? I'd lay down my life for you. Why can't I go with you now? The Lord answered, Peter, would you lay down your life for me? Be careful before you speak too quick about anything. You might wish you didn't. Would you lay down your life? I want to tell you, Peter, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. Now imagine you're in the city of Jerusalem, a city that hates the Lord, that hates his teaching. A city in which the religious leaders, that was his greatest enemy, religion. The religious enemies of Jesus want him dead. They've already decided. Because of the things he says and does, he's got to go. They've already decided they're going to kill him. Through his ministry, Jesus has tried to explain this to his disciples. <laughs> you, you try to explain something to someone and you just see that look on their face and you know they ain't getting it. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. So now he's spending special time with them. He's eating the last Passover supper. He'll never eat with them. But he tells them, I'm going to leave. Look in 16.6. Now, of course, for the sake of time, I'm not going to be able to go over all four of these chapters in detail, so I'd like for you to read them when you get home. It'll mean more to you, John 13, 14, 15, 16, than just hearing a little exposition of a few minutes. 16, 6, look what he says to them. Sorrow has filled your heart. Why? Because of what I've said to you. What did he say to them that brought sorrow? I'm going to leave you. They're going to be left alone in a city that hates them. They're filled with sorrow. They've been with Him about three years. Imagine hearing those beautiful sermons, seeing all those wonderful miracles, seeing people raised from the dead. And now He's going to be gone? It's a difficult time. It's special, but it's difficult. 
And there's so much they don't understand. In John 14, 12, what we must understand, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus called all His disciples together and He chose 12 apostles. And that's who is with at this time, those 12 apostles. When Jesus is gone from this earth, when they kill Him and He leaves this earth and goes back to heaven, they got to carry on the work that He started. They're going to have a large part in the founding of His church. You remember Matthew 16, 18? He said, Upon this rock, I will build my church. They're going to have a big part in the founding of His church. And they're going to have a huge part in the leading and development of that church in its early history. What an important place they, they're going to play. So He's spending this time. Jesus is about to die. They don't get it. They're going to get it. When they see Him up on that cross, the death of a common criminal, when they see Him on that cross, then they're going to understand. But they couldn't understand a dead Messiah. They're fixing to understand within a matter of hours. So He's preparing them for this. In a few days, the Lord's church is going to be established on the earth and recorded in Acts chapter 2. And they're going to play a large part in that. He's preparing them. So many things are going to happen. He's going to die. He's going to be buried. And to their other amazement, He was raised from the dead. Then in Acts chapter 1, verse 6 and following, He ascends back into the heavens to sit at the right hand of God where He now sits and rules and reigns over His church. How do you get people ready for that? Well, wouldn't have been easy. What did they need for the coming day? You know what they needed? What we need. A big dose of humility. Not pride and arrogance and look how religious I am and how wonderful I am. Just look at me. No, we need humility. Let me tell you about these guys. They were worse than we are. Look in Luke 9, 24. You know what? They're, they're in an argument. You ever get in an argument with somebody? Well, usually isn't it about the dumbest things. You left the door open. Really big matters. They're in an argument here. In Luke 9, 24, and you know who they're, what they're arguing about? Who's going to be the greatest? Now, isn't that great? Here's the men that are going to continue the work of Christ and they're arguing about who's going to be the greatest among them. Luke 22, 24. Did you know during this Passover supper, do you know they're arguing again? Makes you wonder if they just argued all the time. Here they are arguing again. And you know what they're arguing about now? Who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to be the greatest? This is during the last Passover Jesus has with His disciples, and they're arguing about who's going to be the greatest. Man, I, I tell you the truth, if it had been me, I'd have thought right there, this ain't going to work. 
we're we going to have to come up with another plan. These guys ain't going to fit the bill. They're arguing about who's going to be the greatest. Matthew 20, verse number 20. James and John, with their little mother, come to Jesus. And he can tell they want something. So he just comes out and asks them, okay, what is it you desire? What do you want? What, what, you know, he can get read their hearts and their minds. What, what is it you want? Well, Lord, can one of us sit on the right hand and one of us on the left hand? That was the two prominent places of authority and rulership in the first century. That's why it says Jesus went to the right hand of God. There's significance there. That's the greatest place of authority. In Matthew 28, 18, He gave Jesus all authority. So these guys are arguing in Matthew 20, are begging Jesus if they can have places of authority. And they're bringing their sweet little mother and she's got to go get in on it. Now who could say no to a sweet little lady? Jesus said, you don't even know what you're asking. They didn't even understand the nature of the kingdom at this point. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 6 and following, it seems like they still hadn't got it because they asked Him, well, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Are you going to make us a great military power now? They just don't get it. So in Matthew 20 and verse 24, when the other ten apostles hear what these two have done, guess what? They are filled with indignation. You know what that means? They were mad. They were mad that somebody else was asking to get the chief places of authority. People have fought for it down through the centuries. Fight to have power over men. Fight to have some great place of authority where you can be looked up to and admired and tell people what they should be doing. That's the nature of humanity. And that's what they're arguing about. Can we be the greatest? When the kingdom's here, can we be the greatest? So if John chapter 13 confuses you, keep that in your mind. They're arguing about who's going to be the greatest. And then Jesus takes out a towel and starts to clean their filthy feet. In the first century, they wore open sandals and the Roman roads were dusty and the Judean roads were dusty. And your feet get terrible, terrible dirty after a day of walking in that. And so when you would go into someone's house, the slave would come in and wash your feet. Here's the one who created heaven and earth He is down on his knees washing these guys' feet. And they're arguing who's going to be the greatest. And here's the Lord of heaven and earth down on his knees washing the feet. Why did he do that? John 13, 15. I have left you an example. Not a church doctrine that should be followed throughout the ages. That wouldn't even make sense now. We don't need our feet to be washed because we got boots. We don't have open sandals. And when I grew up in the 60s, we all had them. We had a lot of other junk too. But nowadays, most people don't need that. It It doesn't even make sense now to do it. But in that culture, that was a place of humility. And here's the Lord of heaven washing their feet. That's what they needed. Humility. 
Paul said in Romans 12, verse 3, we ought not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but we ought to think soberly according as God has given to every man the measure of faith. Paul said in the book of Galatians, if you think you're something when you're nothing, and that's what all of us are, compared to the Lord and Savior, if you think that you're something when you are nothing, you deceive yourself. You don't deceive anybody else. Everybody else can see through right through it. I could see as a little child when those religious leaders paraded in front of us and did all those religious acts that took hours and hours, and I thought, what in the world? Why can't I wear clothes like that? And my mama said, have one. You're not one of our precious leaders. I thought right then, oh my. Power. That's what they want. In Matthew 25, Matthew 20 and verse 25, Jesus explained to them, when they come to Him, I ask them to have this place of authority. Jesus might look. He, he said, in the world, in the world, among the Gentiles, they have princes over them that exercise authority upon them. That's the way it is in the world. But in Matthew 20, verse 25, Jesus said, it shall not be so among you. It shall not be that way. And when we make it that way, we are thumbing our fist in the face of the Savior. Humility. That's what they needed. That's what they needed. All right, He's told them. He's told them, look, I want to leave you. You can't go. What do they need? Go back to John. Gospel of John. Verse 14. What do they need? He looks out over those troubled souls. And he says to them, Let not your hearts be troubled. 16.6, they're filled with sorrow. And so in 14.1, Jesus didn't say, oh, dry it up. What's the matter with you? You got to be tough. No, that's not what the Savior said. I never read any foolish words like that from His mouth. These men are in sorrow. And look what Jesus says to them, John 14, 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house or many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there, you may be also. And where I go, you know, in the way, you know. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we don't know how, where you're going and how can we know the way? They don't understand. And the most famous statement of Jesus is found in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. They had to understand He's the only way to God. No other way, no other religion. He's the only way. And they had to trust in Him. That's what He's saying in 14, 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. That word believe there has the idea of trust. You've trusted in God all of your life. Now you've got to trust in me. You've got to trust. So what they need? They needed humility. They needed trust. John 14, 27. What did they need? My peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. They needed peace. They're in tribulation. They're hurting. 
Jesus said, I'll leave you my peace. I give it to you. It's not like the world gives. The world can't offer that. Jesus can. My peace, I leave with you. Paul said in Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7, Don't be anxious about anything, but by everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. They needed peace. How are these men going to be at peace with one another when they're not at peace with God? How are we going to have peace with one another as God's people if we don't have peace with our Maker? Romans 5, 1 says, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. They needed peace. What do these men need? How is Jesus going to p- p- prepare them for what's coming? How's He going to do that? How? John 14. John 14. You know what they needed? Instead of power and get to tell somebody what to do, instead of that, what they needed was humble, Submission. Humility before their fellow man. And submission before the God of the universe. Submission before their Lord Jesus Christ. So he says in John 14, 15, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. In John 14, 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. John 14, 23, John 14, 23. The one who has the commandments of God and keeps them, he's the one that loves Christ. Now look in verse 24, John 14, 24. He that keepeth not my commandments does not love me. John 15, 14. You're my friends. Oh, I want to be the friend of Jesus. I want to be all of you guys' friends. Maybe that's not possible. It says, if it be possible. Maybe it's not possible. Okay. But I'd like to be. But more than your friendship, which is precious to me, your encouragements, your letters, your phone calls, your text. You don't know what those mean to me. But let me tell you what's more important. I want to be the friend of Jesus Christ. That's one. You're not one. He is one. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 15, 14. You are my friends. What's he say? if you do what I command. John 13, 34, and 35, what did they need? I give you a new commandment. What's the new commandment? That you love one another as I loved you. And by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have loved one for another. The way this community knows that we are following Christ is not how religious we look and if we wear a coat and a tie every Sunday and Sunday night, you know what? That means absolutely nothing to them and it really doesn't mean nothing to me either. That's a dumb custom. That's not Scripture. What they need to see is the way we treat each other. That's the way they know we're following God. Not how religious we look and how religious we sound and how long we can pray and how we can parade our religion before the world. No, they need to see how we treat each other. That's the way they know we're following God. 
submission. That's the key to all of it. Bowing my knee to the Lord of heaven and earth and saying, Lord, not what I will, what you will. That's what he prayed. And that must be my prayer. And that must be your prayer. Submission. Question. We've only looked at a few of them. I got a lot more, but I'm running out of gas. We only looked at a few of them. But here's my question. Are you developing these qualities in your life and it's not, well, I hope so. The answer is yes or no. Not hope so, maybe so, probably so, yes, no. Are you developing these qualities? Do you really love the Lord? If you love Him like you should, He tells you to be immersed and repent of your sins first and then be immersed in water to have those sins forgiven. Not to be immersed in some denominational church that you can't even find in the Bible. He asks you to be immersed into Jesus Christ to have your sins forgiven. If you love Him, you'll do it right now while we stand and sing.